Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. One of the most important qualities for a believer to possess is the ability to submit. We need to recognize authority and then respond properly to that authority. And we do so because, first and foremost, God has commanded us to do just that. He wants us to demonstrate our ability to humble ourselves, recognizing authority for the purpose, and here's the key, for the purpose of fulfilling his will to do that which is good. And that is something that the Apostle Paul is going to emphasize to Titus in this third chapter. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to Paul's epistle to Titus. And now we're ready for chapter three. Now remember, Paul left Titus. He kind of deposited him there in a place called Crete in order that he could have influence over the believers there. And not just over the believers, but in order that the believers there might have a testimony, a God-pleasing testimony that impacts that entire island. So look with me to chapter 3, verse 1. Paul begins this way in speaking to Titus. He says, remind them, and this would be the believers, remind them, and then we have two significant words the words for rulers and authorities so those that are in governmental leadership and paul tells titus that you need to instruct the believers there in regard to rulers and authorities to submit to obey now that's literally what we have here those two words back to back to subject yourself, to submit to, and to obey. And we learn something. It is only through submissiveness can one obey. And if we can't learn to do that to those who have an earthly authority, we'll never be able to do that to those who have a spiritual authority or to God himself. Now, we have to be careful because this and other passages which are similar, and we see that, for example, in Romans 13, this does not give a absolute authority to the government in regard to their right to rule over individuals, and I'm speaking here about believers, for whatever they want. Notice what Paul reminds us. And if we ignore that, we're not going to learn the principle. He continues on, he says, to submit, to obey for every good work to be prepared. What is the objective? The objective is to do every good work, meaning this. Everywhere that we can submit to governmental authority, we should do so for the purpose of that which is good. But if there's a government, and we see that clearly in verses 3 and 4 of Romans 13, if there's a government that they are using and exploiting their authority for that which is not good, against, clearly against, the will of God, the word of God, the commandments of God. Obviously, and there's numerous examples of this in the scripture. We cannot agree to that. We cannot submit to that. Never have some other authority replace 
the absolute authority that God has over the life of every believer. But we're talking about things that do not have adverse spiritual outcomes, that which is not necessarily against any scriptural admonition. If it has no scripture significance and the government tells you to do that, then you are to do that. That's the general theme here. But again, that we would be ready for every good work. Look at verse 2. Here, and Paul speaks in very clear, very bold, and very absolute terms. Verse 2, no one, and he means here, none of you, none of the believers, he says, blaspheme. And the implication is, let none of the believers be speaking in a way that is blasphemous. And the implication is against individuals. Now, most Bibles, even though this is clearly the word, and in fact, it's the Greek word where we get the English word blasphemy from, we look at it and it's the word blaspheme. So it's very clear that we're talking about blasphemy in the pure sense. Now, normally we would think, wait, blasphemy is something that we do against God. That's the the emphasis. It's against him, not against others. But here's what we need to remember. And this is the emphasis of the passage. We need to remember that all people, every human being, is a creation of God. God made that person. He loves that person. He gave them a human dignity. He gave them the right to live in this world until God, he calls them to judgment. Here's the important biblical truth. When we speak against an individual in a blasphemous way, meaning in a way that is is not appropriate, the reason why this term blasphemy appears here is that God takes it personally. So when we blaspheme an individual, in essence, we are saying something negative to his creator. So he says, no one blaspheme, but rather what should we all do? He says, to be, and this word here, many Bibles say peacefully. This is the word aminably. It's a word that, that at the very core, there's a desire to find agreement avoid contention so he's saying we should not seek contention that's not our objective we want to live as much as possible to be at peace with all people to be agreeable not contentious when we set out to be in a contentious way with someone we are attacking that one who was made in god's image Once again, no one blaspheme, but be amenable and gentle. And then we have the word all. And I believe this means at all times in every situation. At all times, he says, showing, showing humility to all people. So these are the two spectrums. You are either going to demonstrate humility being gentle, and this word can mean kind in the English sense, not speaking in a harsh, derogatory way. And again, what the scripture reveals, and this is emphasized strongly in Judaism, that if you slander, and this simply means to speak evil against another. Now, this does not mean that you can't evaluate someone's behavior and say it's wrong. It is incorrect. It is against the will of God. Obviously, we can do those things. But we don't want to speak for the purpose of just being derogatory, putting someone down, attacking someone, slandering someone for the sake of of humiliating them. That is not proper. And when we do so, we need to remember that God takes it personal because that individual has a God-given worth because they are a creation of God. 
Now we're ready for verse 3. Now, the tendency is because a believer has grown, hopefully, matured in the faith, has a different perspective than the world, sometimes because of that, we are, are kind of taken back by how those who are not believers, how they live, what their thoughts are, the decisions they make, and we can have a, a condemning attitude. And Paul warns us here not to have such a view because he says, for once also we, and he's speaking about how those who do not know the truth, what are they? He says, foolish, disobedient, being deceived. So once we too were in that same situation before God by his grace, his love, he saved us. Prior to that, we were no different than anyone else. So he emphasizes for once, and the implication is also. For once also we were foolish, disobedient, having been deceived. And notice something else. This next word is, is taken from the Greek word for slave. It is a verb, so it's to be enslaved. And all humanity before salvation, we were enslaved to, he says here, to desires, a variety of desires and pleasures. Now, this is an important biblical truth. Prior to salvation, all of creation, why? Because of original sin. Because of that sinful, carnal nature. What in Hebrew is called the yetzer hara, an evil inclination. That is our natural state from a spiritual standpoint. So he says all were in that same way, being foolish, being disobedient, and having been deceived. And the implication is by the enemy. Because of sin manifests itself and at work in our life. And because of that, he says, being in bondage, being in bondage to a variety of desires and the next word is a word for pleasure. And this word for pleasure always has to do with that which is pleasurable to the natural man, not the spiritual man. So he says that's what people who are not redeemed, that's their plight. That's where they are living in, in a state of disobedience, in foolishness, walking, making decisions based upon the fact that they have been deceived and in bondage to a pursuit of their own desires, this variety of desires and seeking pleasure. But there's going to be a change. He goes on, look at the second part of, of verse, verse 3. He continues to say that such a person is in evilness and envy. Now, those two words are very important because this word here, evilness, is the word for that which is in conflict, that which is opposite in contradiction to the will of God. So being deceived, having a foolish perspective, having that tendency to disobey, being in bondage to a variety of desires and, and pleasures, we are going to be in evilness. That is, everything about us is going to be contrary to the will of God. And not only that, he also says, and jealousy or envy. We're going to want what other people have. And not only that, he says as well, that we're going to be, and the next word is a word of lifestyle, a word of behavior. It has to do with, with basically, if we look at it, it has to be with being brought through. We are going to go through this life in evilness and those things that are rooted in a, a desire for something that oftentimes we cannot achieve. And therefore, he ends this this. Third verse by saying, 
the word here is that in the end, and he's summarizing, that the people are, and I would translate this word, despicable. That which is rejectable. And we need to see that man in our original normal state, we are despicable, that is rejectable to God. And he says, and this is seen also in the fact that they're hateful, also hating one another. Because of my desires for what I want, the pleasures that I'm seeking, and because that I'm against God's will, and I'm living in such a way that, that demonstrates frustration because I have that envy and I'm not getting what I want, what's going to be the outcome? I will do despicable things which characterize me, and in the end, there's going to be conflict. This is what James says. Where do conflicts and wars come from? He answers the question. They come from desires. I want and I see others as an obstacle to me achieving my desires. And because of that, I have malice and ill feelings and I see them as an obstacle to either overcome, put down, and defeat. So it's the exact opposite. What he's talking about here is the exact opposite of loving your neighbor as yourself. This is the plight of humanity left to ourselves. But beginning in this next verse, verse 4, there is a significant change, the change I referenced earlier. He says, but, and if your Bible says and, it's that conjunction of, of disunity, that which shows a difference. Look again at verse 4. But when the kindness now this is a word it's it's loosely related to grace but we're not talking about necessarily that biblical concept of grace but more of an understanding of being gracious kind uh, uh friendly something along those lines so when but when the kindness and and the next word has to do with its two greek words for loving and humanity so i would translate it as a humanitarian uh, uh, attitude so god this is going to refer to god god who is kind-hearted god who is gracious god who is a lover of humanity why we are his workmanship his creation so because of these characteristics of God, that he's a kind God and that he is a humanitarian, a lover of humanity, what do we see? Well, we see that something was manifested. This kindness, this loving of humanitarian was manifested. And it's very important that we see it's in the passive. Just like where it says the grace of God was manifested. We talked about that from chapter 2, verse 11. There was a cause. It just didn't happen in a vacuum. It wasn't a, a chance occurrence. It was something that was brought about in a cognitive, in a purposeful way. So when the kindness and the humanitarian quality was manifested and it was manifested by God, our Savior. Now, this is something that we have seen repeatedly. God, our Savior. These characteristic traits of God, him being kind, him being a lover of humanity, that brought about a manifestation. And this God who's being manifested is called over and over by Paul in this epistle to Titus. He's called our Savior. Once more. But when the kindness and the humanitarian quality was manifested by God our Savior, and then he tells us this is going to have a powerful outcome and this outcome is not, notice what he wants to immediately teach us, not from the works of righteousness which we have done. 
These things, kindness and the lover of humanity, it didn't come about because of us. It wasn't manifested by righteous works that humanity has done. That's what he wants to emphasize. It was manifested, but not by the, the righteous works which we have done, but, and this is a very significant word, but, and it's a different word, it's not that conjunction, but it stands out, but, and we might say, but rather according to, and this is so significant, his mercy. Realize, biblically speaking, there is an inherent relationship between mercy and forgiveness. When you have mercy, you'll have a desire to forgive. So God, he's kind. God loves humanity. And also God is merciful. And those qualities, these traits, these attributes of God brought about him manifesting himself as our Savior and our God. Read on. Verse, verse 5, second part. Because of this mercy, it says, and he saved us. Now, that term, he saved us, is in the Greek heiress. Now, normally we hear that and we think that it's just the past, that he has done the work, and he has, for the saving of humanity. When he says it's finished, everything that needed to be done for humanity to be saved was done. But the heiress just doesn't describe at times a past action sometimes. The heiress is used for an action that has not been done, has not been completed. So why is this heiress used, this, this Greek tense? Well, remember... We talked at another time that the aorist can be used to describe something in its entirely, to describe something completely. So here, although he's sharing with us the means of our salvation, it came about because God is kind, God loves humanity, and God is merciful. Those things brought about a manifestation that in the end god saved humanity potentially he did everything that was necessary that humanity be saved but we need to realize something in this verse he's not so much talking about simply the means of salvation i mean this passage there's many other ones if we want to talk about the means of justification, the means of redemption, how one is saved. There's many other passages we would turn to. But here God has, he has touched on that, but his objective is the outcome. Looking at salvation from a greater perspective of what that's going to ultimately bring about. And why am I saying that? Well, keep reading in this same verse, verse 5. But rather, his mercy, because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. This last part of this verse is very, very significant. It's significant because the Holy Spirit is mentioned. And we need to realize the Holy Spirit was indeed a, a known entity in the Tanakh. We see that the Holy Spirit is related to the Spirit of God and it's connected to, he is connected to redemption. There's a verse of scripture that we read every day in the synagogue and it's about that a redeemer will come forth from zion that means for the purpose of establishing zion 
and he will turn away. He's going to deal with the sin of Jacob. And because of that work of redemption, we're going to see the outcome of the covenant, God's covenantal purpose. And for that outcome to be fulfilled in your life, in my life, it can't be done in the flesh. It's going to be done through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So we see that in that passage, it speaks about how God in Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21, because of redemption and God's covenantal responsibility, he is going to pour out his spirit upon those who are redeemed. So whenever we see the Holy Spirit, him being mentioned in a biblical passage, we need to bring into our understanding this concept of redemption. Redemption brings about the potential for the will of God to be achieved. That's what he's saying here. So he saved us through the washing of, and pay attention to this next word, most Bibles will translate it regeneration. Now, regeneration is a very important theological term. But we need to point out that here, it is not in reference to the normal understanding of regeneration. We need to pause and have a right understanding of what Paul is telling Titus and not how many individuals twist this passage in order to justify a theological concept that they have. Let me begin by saying regeneration the key verse that describes it. Now, that word doesn't really appear in the Bible. Just like the word uh, Trinity in its, its clear form doesn't appear. But the Bible speaks of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The word regeneration here is somewhat different in its implication, its meaning, how it's being used and for the purpose of, of what is being said here. We all know the scripture that says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away, behold, all things are new. Theologians, and I have no problem with this, theologians speak of this new creation with the concept of regeneration. A person, man or woman, becomes that new creation. We say he has been regenerated. And the word here comes from the Greek word for born. It's related to being born again. So if you look at biblical verses for regeneration, you're going to find the passages that speak about new life, being born again, and such. But what's interesting is this word that's used here when it says the washing of, and here's the key, regeneration. Now, it comes from two Greek words, this word regeneration, the word again, and then the word for generation or being generated, and it's a word of birth. So a, a birth again. And you would say, well, that fits what we're talking about. Well, be careful. Because once more, the problem is this. People are lazy. They don't do what they must do to be able to speak properly in regard to theological truth. They are oftentimes so interested in justifying their own preconceived belief, what they've been taught, they hold on to that, and now they're not willing to let go of it. Because here's the problem. Many people teach about regeneration. There's nothing wrong with the concept of regeneration being a new creation. The Bible refers to that, but not by that word regeneration, by, by being a new creation. It refers to it by being born again. But this is different. And I'll prove that in a moment, but let me deal with the issue at hand. And that is, there are those who teach, and this is what Reformed theology, Calvinism, is, is about. They teach because of a, a absolute depravity. Now, we have to be very clear about something. Depravity, let me say that right, depravity. That speaks about our utter 
inability to save ourselves, that we are absolutely lost in our sin. But here's the problem. Calvinism takes that to say this. Because we are lost in sin, dead in our trespasses, we are unable to respond in any way to the truth of God. What we forget is this. Even the non-believer, the one who is dead, lost in sin, unable to save himself, still God has equipped with that one a conscience. And that means this, even in the state of lostness, being a non-believer, rejecting the gospel, that person can still read many of the commandments and say, that's good. We ought not still. I understand that lying is wrong. I think it's right to honor the father and mother. There's many things that a non-believer can read in the Bible and affirm as right, proper, and good, even though they are depraved, that is. They're unable to save themselves. They're lost, they're dead in their sins and transgressions. Still, to a certain degree, the conscience can work and agree with God. And that conscience can be used in order to understand sinfulness. A lost person who is depraved can understand sin perfectly, no, but sufficiently to understand that he is a sinner and that this one is in need of salvation. And the work of God through the scripture can touch his conscience in order to say, I need to be saved and understand that gospel. I'm not saying that that eliminates the Holy Spirit from working, but it does not mean that, and here's what Calvinism says. Calvinism says that regeneration precedes salvation, meaning this. First, God, because of his sovereignty, God is sovereign, but this is not a right understanding of it. They will say because God is sovereign, he has chosen, he has elected some for the kingdom of God and others he has not. Those that he has elected based upon his will, based upon his choice, his election, he regenerates them. First, he makes them a new creation and it's only after being that new creation, then and only then, will they receive the gospel. So they say regeneration comes first. As an outcome of regeneration, one can respond to the gospel. And many look at this verse of scripture. But here's the problem. They rush to this word regeneration. And what I always say to them, I'll say, well, where does that word regeneration, that same word, appear elsewhere in the scripture? And I've never had any, now that doesn't mean that there aren't some Calvinists that, that don't know or do know this, but I've never encountered one that will say, oh, that same word appears in the book of Matthew chapter 19. And here's what we need to see. This word is not speaking about regeneration in the normal theological sense. What Paul is speaking here is about how God has saved us and that he's done so with a purpose through an intent of his. And what is that intent? That intent is that there's going to be a washing, a regeneration. These two things go hand in hand. There's going to be a washing, a cleansing, and a regeneration. What is he referring to here? Well, the only other time that this word appears in the scripture is Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. And I would suggest to you that it would be wise for one to look at the only other use of this word. Failure to do this, if it was a, a physician, we would say it's malpractice. And when someone teaches on this verse, and, and ties it to the normal understanding of the theological term regeneration for the individual, that person is practicing theological malpractice. Why? The only place that it appears, look with me to Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, 
You can look at the context, but one verse will give us enough. Verse 28, but Yeshua said to them, who's he speaking to? His disciples. He says to primarily the 12 disciples in this context, but Yeshua said to them, truly I say to you that you, the ones who are following after me in the, here it is, regeneration. So he's speaking to his disciples and he says, in the regeneration, what does he mean here? Well, it's a new birth. But this is not speaking about the individual. It's speaking about the world. It is speaking about the purpose, the outcome for creation, not the individual, for creation, that it's going to be regenerated. Speaking about the kingdom. Look again, verse 28. But Yeshua said to them, Truly I say to you that you, the ones who follow after me, in the regeneration, whenever the Son of Man should sit upon his glorious throne, his throne of glory. Now realize something. The term regeneration, as I said, has nothing to do with the individual. It has to do with a concept of establishing the kingdom of God when Messiah rules. So he says, whenever the Son of Man should, should sit upon his glorious throne, also you shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, what it's saying here is this, that regeneration is when God brings order, his judgment into this world. Let's go back to Titus. What he's saying here in this regeneration is this, that we have been saved and this has to do with a change that is coming both in the individual, but primarily in the world, when there's this washing of renewal, this regeneration that's going to take place and the renewal, let's finish up this verse, verse 5, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So we don't see in the Scripture the Holy Spirit falling on people and then believing. We see that people believe, study the book of Acts, the person believes, and the outcome of believing is becoming a recipient of the Holy Spirit. This is what Paul demonstrates, for example, in Acts 19. He meets disciples. Whose disciples? The disciples of John, John the Baptist, who heard that there was one coming, these individuals, these disciples, but they did not know Yeshua. And therefore, what does Paul do? Paul being a perfect student, a teacher of theology, he says, you know about the Holy Spirit. They go, we have not even heard so much that there is a Holy Spirit. He says, then, what did you believe? And they said, we believed in the baptism of John the Baptist to repent, turn away from sin, that's what God wants, and to believe on the one who is coming. Then what did Paul do? He taught them a more excellent way. He revealed to them Yeshua that they would believe. And having believed in Messiah, then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see in the scripture, belief brings about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Without faith, the Holy Spirit's not going to be functioning in the person's life to produce new life. The Holy Spirit can function in a non-believer before him, bringing them, assisting them, giving them insight. But the Holy Spirit will not dwell in a non-believer, and nor will the Holy Spirit work in a non-believer to bring about regeneration. Only after believing, this is what the scripture reveals. Verse, verse 6. Not, 
here he says which excuse me which in referring to the holy spirit which he has poured out upon us richly by means of who through yeshua messiah the christ our savior now notice when he speaks about messiah he's a savior and he pours out the holy spirit upon the one whom messiah has saved not the other way around and the outcome of that now we're ready for verse verse seven in order that being made righteous so now because of salvation we have been made righteous by and this is a very interesting phrase and every translation i checked 29 gets it wrong now most will say in fact i believe uh 28 of 29 translate this his grace one and i'm speaking about the berean literal bible gets it partially right but they make an error they say that grace now what's the word the word is that but we can't say that grace why because the word for that is in the masculine the word for grace is in the feminine so you can't have the phrase that modifying grace that grace is incorrect now the intent as 28 of the 29 versions of the bible translations that i that i studied the intent his grace is correct but it doesn't say his grace the word that is in the genitive what is that it is in the the state of referring to belonging to something so it literally says i realize that this may because i'm not doing the best job be confusing but what it literally says is in order being justified by the grace of that one that is not referring to grace but referring to that one who is that one messiah so i understand why they would say his grace because it is referring to the grace of messiah yeshua so why is it improper to translate it his grace because we're not receiving the intent of the literalness of the greek text that phrase of that one makes messiah emphatic it's saying it's the grace of yeshua his grace but the construction tells us it's only the grace of that one there's no other sources that grace belongs to that one and the implication is only that one it emphasizes it teaches that he's the only savior not one of others but but he's unique it emphasizes his uniqueness and the unique grace that he provides which justifies us now verse 8 the word is faithful it's a trustworthy it's a true word what we're studying the word is faithful and concerning this i want you and now he talks about confirming it and the implication here is that he wants him to confirm it that you would be confirming it that you are and that you will continue to confirm this and also that the ones believing in god that they should and this is a word for to think of to to act in regard to that the believers of god that they would be concerned with that they would be be engaging in good works and also we find this word for being being responsible so that they would be thinking of and being responsible in doing good works i want to emphasize 
This phrase, good works, is repeated over and over in this chapter, and we saw it in other chapters of the book of Titus. So this is a faithful word concerning this. I want that you should confirm in order that the believers of God, that they think, that they give consideration to these good works and that they be responsible. The word literally means is to stand before them, being responsible for making sure that good works are done. Why? Now look at the second part of verse 8. These things are good and profitable for men. Now, this goes back to one of the primary objectives, what he talked about earlier, that we're not derogatory, that we're not building ourselves up, but that we're humble, that our objective, objective is not to get what we want, but that we do good works, that we become an instrument of blessings to other people so this is something that should characterize every believer's life that we are because we're believers we are engaging we are responsible in doing good works these are good and profitable for man for humanity verse 9 but what happens is this Instead of being someone who engage in good works, what do they do? Well, don't be, he says, foolish and uh, uh, engage in contention and genealogies and strife and another word for conflict. So what he's saying is a person is either going to be mindful and responsible to engage in good works, that's what believers of God do. And if they're not believers of God, one of the ways that you can see this is that they are going to be engaging in contentions and foolishness that concerns genealogies and other debatable things and having conflict. And what are they debating about? Notice it says here, of the law. Now, the law, we shouldn't debate it. We shouldn't focus in on, on genealogies, and we're talking about extra-biblical genealogies and debates about how to serve God. It's clear. The Word of God reveals it. And people want to get into these esoteric, these long things to really keep them away of serving one another being a disciple, being an instrument of God. So there's a warning. Don't engage with these doubtful contentions concerning genealogies and matters of the law that bring about strife and contention. He tells us here, and remember the word in the previous verse, I said that we should be thoughtful of and responsible to engage in good deeds. So this word for responsible is meaning to stand before. It's a word of priority. To stand with a priority about something. But in regard to these contentions about the law and genealogies, notice that he uses a word, same root but a different preposition, and this means to, to stand to avoid, to stand around them, to go around them, to not be connected to them. For they, he says here, for, for avoid these things because they are not profitable and lacking value. They don't profit and they have no value to them whatsoever. Verse 10, in regard to those who love to just sit around and debate matters that have, and let me just be real honest. I get many questions sent to me that the Bible doesn't answer. And people will say, some are even aware of that. I know the Bible doesn't really speak to this, but what do you think? What difference does it make? If the Bible doesn't give a clear response to it, if the Bible doesn't deal with it, why should we 
conjure up and think about it. Put that away. There is enough questions that the Bible do answer that we should know, learn, study, and share with others. But all too often, people want to major in debatable things rather than in the truth of God. And that's why he says, verse 10, a device of man with one or two, the first or second admonition, admonition. So after the first or the second admonition, he says, reject this one. If this one is always wanting to bring up these things that are always disputed for the purpose of, of making division, he says, admonish them once, twice. After that, very clearly, reject them. Verse, verse 11. Knowing that being incorrupt, being corruptible, this one was corrupted, being corrupted, this one. Such a person is corrupted and sins, and we have this word for contentious. He simply, what it speaks is, he is contentious, but if we look at this word, it means katakrino is to judge down. So we want God to lift us up. And the word here is literally this one being sinful and self-condemned. His action manifests, his own actions manifest that he's going to be condemned already. Now, verse 12. Verse 12 through 15, these four verses, Paul's concluding this epistle. He says, whenever... I send Artemis to you, or he may not send this one, he may send one that we encountered before, Tikikos. Whenever I should send to you Artemis or Tikikos, he says, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. Now, Nicopolis is a city that means a victorious city a city that overcomes. But Paul has decided, says, says, for there I have judged, I have decided to spend the winter. So Paul's sending one of these individuals to Titus, and he says, when they get there, you be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. Also, Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos, be diligent and this word means to supply. Supply them for the journey in order that they lack nothing. So Paul's giving instructions to those who assist him. He says, I'm going to send one to you. And also these two, the lawyer, and this means an expert in Torah law, this man, Zenos, and Apollos, he says, when, when they are, are there, be diligent to supply everything that they have nothing that lacks. Verse 14. But the others teach them. And this is a word for instructing them. And here's another time. Good works that they should be. And this is the, the second time we've seen this word to be responsible. Teach the others that they should be responsible. They have a responsibility of good works. For this is an essential need. What it literally says is this is a necessary need. For people to be engaging, mindful, responsible of good works. In order that they're not unfruitful. And I would suggest to you that this is one of Paul's primary things, that we're not unfruitful, but that we have much fruit and that we're engaging in good deeds. Here again, not for salvation, not to make us righteous, but to manifest <coughs> our salvation, to manifest that we have been made righteous by our Savior, by His work, by His redemption through His blood and death on the cross. Last verse, and we'll conclude. He says, 
the ones, all the ones with me greet you. Here again, speaking specifically to Titus. He says, all the ones with me greet you. And you greet the ones who love us in the faith. So those who are fellow believers, who have love for Paul and the ones who are with him, he says, you greet them, and the implication is for us. And then how does Paul conclude? The grace be with all of you. Amen. And let me just say as I conclude how significant grace is. Paul frequently begins his epistles by saying grace and peace. And he frequently ends by emphasizing grace. Because grace, as we've talked about, it not only brings salvation, but grace works in our life to to cause us to deny those things that are against God and to be engaging in those things now that are pleasing to God in this present world to produce much fruit in order that the will of God is achieved. You cannot speak about God's grace and remove it from its objective of bringing about a fulfillment of God's will. And that's why I emphasize so frequently that we need to be people who are committed to the will of God. And that is manifested if we are committed by our good works, those deeds that manifest that kingdom character in a person's life. Well, I'll close with that. Thank you for being part of our virtual conference. And we look forward to next year, God willing, when we're able to gather once more for our national conference in Orlando, Florida. Until then, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.